how are you all doing? I know it's after lunch and if you feel like you need to doze off a little bit, that's totally okay. It wouldn't be the first time, so feel free. Um, let me ask before we get started, who here knows somebody with Parkinson's disease? Okay, so a fair amount of people. Um, my name is Carissa Campanella and I am the program director for NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's. We are a nonprofit organization whose mission is simply to help people with Parkinson's disease and their families live a better quality of life. And we do that in three ways, through educational groups, um, through educational programs and events, through support groups, and through individualized care advising. So if you know someone with Parkinson's, they can meet with me or our Charlotte County Care Advisor, Chelsea Dooley, who's in the back of the room with us today. And we can help direct people with Parkinson's and their families to community resources that can help them. So since today's theme is caring for the caregiver, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease today and how it actually affects not only the person that has it, but the people taking care of the person with Parkinson's as well. I always say to, to, to families, there's usually one person that's carrying the disease, <coughs> the disease is affecting the entire family. So first off, what is Parkinson's exactly? Well, Parkinson's disease is what's known as a chronic, meaning it's going to last forever, and progressive disorder, meaning it's going to get worse over time, uh, it's a, of the brain and central nervous system that causes a variety of movement challenges. And it's marked by the deficiency of a chemical messenger called dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter. And dopamine is responsible for the regulation of movement, but interestingly, it's also responsible for mood. So sometimes people with Parkinson's disease experience depression prior to the onset of Parkinson's due to that deficiency of that chemical messenger called dopamine. Now, if you are familiar with Parkinson's disease, you probably are familiar with the four movement symptoms. And those include a resting tremor, usually on one side of the body, so a shaking hand. We're all familiar with the Parkinson's tremor slowness or stiffness in movement, muscle rigidity, small steps, and trouble with balance. Those are the outward symptoms of Parkinson's that people see. Maybe you think of Muhammad Ali or Michael J. Fox and you've seen them shake or move slowly or you've heard of people falling who have Parkinson's. But the symptoms that I think are more interesting and in some ways more debilitating <coughs> And the symptoms that certainly affect the caregivers the most are the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And this is where the disease gets very, very complex. So many of you probably don't know that the first early symptoms of Parkinson's disease that come on years before we see the tremor or the muscle stiffness are loss of smell and constipation. But I'll tell you what, it's a very, very rare primary care doctor that will take those two symptoms and think, hmm, this could be early signs of Parkinson's disease. Many neurologists don't ask to look for those two symptoms. But those are two non-motor symptoms that we see many times, maybe five or 10 years before we see the motor symptoms. Many people with Parkinson's experience what's called facial masking or decreased facial expression. We have this gentleman that comes to our support groups who's had Parkinson's for 25 years, and he's a very positive and upbeat gentleman. And he used to be in the clothing industry, and he was a salesperson, and he loved his job. And one day, his boss said to him when he was in his 50s, he said, hey, how come you're looking so sad? Your sales are great. You should be smiling. And this gentleman actually was in the early stages of Parkinson's and was showing a masked face, a lack of expression. And that was his first indicator that something wasn't right with him because he was feeling good, but wasn't showing it. There's a whole cluster of symptoms in Parkinson's that are called the cognitive and behavioral symptoms. People with Parkinson's have what are known as behavioral symptoms, so symptoms that affect your behavior. Depression, we mentioned that earlier. That's marked by a loss of pleasure, feelings of hopelessness or guilt, feelings of not wanting to do your activities of daily living that last three months or longer. So you can imagine how debilitating depression is, especially when you have slowness of movement and muscle stiffness. Then there's anxiety. 
a lot of people in our Parkinson's community do have anxiety, and that's a feeling of worry, um, of, of worry and anxiety that really has no cause or no origin. We have a, a lady in our community who told me once, my husband is so anxious that he follows me into every room of the house. He has Parkinson's disease and he's afraid to let me out of, uh, out of, my, out of his sight. The only place he doesn't follow me is the bathroom and then he just waits outside the door for me to come out. And that's a real good example of a high level of anxiety in a, a person with Parkinson's. Then there's a clinical symptom that very few people know about and that's apathy. We know what apathy is, right? That's when we just feel kind of blah. Maybe you have, a, have a, a lazy day at home where you don't want to leave your house. You just aren't really interested in doing anything. You're not feeling sad or depressed. You just have a lack of motivation. <laughs> well, that's a real clinical symptom of Parkinson's disease, and it's very difficult to treat. So now you're getting a better picture of what someone with Parkinson's may have to go through in addition to the physical symptoms that they have they're also internally dealing with behavioral symptoms and cognitive impairments. So what do we mean by cognitive impairments? We learned a lot about Alzheimer's earlier today. And the cognitive changes we see with Parkinson's are somewhat similar. Parkinson's has its own subset of dementia, but it's different from Alzheimer's dementia. With Alzheimer's, there's no memory track. So if I say three words like ball, scissors, paste, to somebody with Alzheimer's, they're not gonna remember those words because they were never laid down. They just didn't register in the brain. For someone with Parkinson's, you can say those three words. I don't even remember what they are. Ball, paste, <laughs> something else. Help me out, scissors, okay. So, so actually what, what just happened to me is something similar that would happen to someone with Parkinson's. The memory is laid down, it's just very difficult to bring it back up, to remember details about things. So that's one area of cognitive impairment. Another is what's called slowness in thinking, or slowness in processing information. Now, I'm from New Jersey, so I talk fast by nature, but I've learned to try and slow it down and pause, because I know my Parkinson's community can't keep up with a fast-paced New Jersey rate of speech. It takes people with Parkinson's longer to listen to what's being said and then to formulate their response back. And what can end up happening is that people who have their social circles stop hanging out with the friends that they spend time with because they can't keep up with conversation. And then people with Parkinson's can become isolated, as can their caregivers. So these are the symptoms that really affect the caregivers more than the person with I won't say more, but they have, I think, more of an effect from what I've heard from our caregiving community. They have more of an effect on caregivers than the physical symptoms. Many of our caregivers in our community say, I can handle the, the shaking, I can handle helping them move, you know, move, because when they're moving slowly, but it's these behavioral symptoms, the apathy, the anxiety that make working with, that make caring for people with Parkinson's very, very challenging. So I just want you to be aware of that. There's stages of Parkinson's, mild, moderate, severe. In the milder stages, people with Parkinson's are maybe working, they're doing their activities of daily living, they may have a tremor, but everything is, is going along okay. In the mid to later stages, movement becomes more challenged, there's higher levels of stability. We start to see utilization of walkers, and things of that nature. And what's interesting is, because Parkinson's is not a fatal disease, you can live with it for 25, 30, 35 years. We have people in our community that have had it for many, many years. So you may actually live out your natural lifespan and never experience the later stages of Parkinson's, but many people do. Here's some demographic data for you. Who gets Parkinson's disease? We know that there's about 1.5 million people in the United States that have been diagnosed. That number, like um, Alzheimer's, is projected to grow all time, um, Parkinson's is projected to double by the year 2040. So we're gonna see a lot more instances of it, especially as our population ages. We know in our immediate area, there's about 10,000 people affected. By the way, NeuroChallenge Foundation has served 2,700 of those in the past year. Um, that's why we're out in the community educating because we wanna help everyone that needs our help. We know that Parkinson's typically develops after age 60, usually around 62. If it occurs before the age of 50, that's young onset. 
Michael J. Fox was diagnosed at 29, which is exceedingly young. And because of that, he's going to live out every manifestation of the disease because he's got many years to go. A lot of times at our support groups, people with Parkinson's will say, how did I get this? Why me? And I get it because it's a really difficult, frustrating disease. But it's not like smoking and lung cancer. There's no direct cause. People don't bring this on themselves. There is some speculation that it's caused by toxin exposure, so we have a lot of veterans of war, um, people that work in industrial type careers. And then sometimes it's just what's known as idiopathic. People get it for no reason. So sometimes we just can't pinpoint it. Now who treats Parkinson's disease? This is really important information to know. If you're lucky, you'll have a primary care doctor who notices that something's amiss. But most primary care doctors aren't doing regular screenings for Parkinson's. You know why? The best way to identify someone may have Parkinson's potentially is to see them walk, seeing that shuffling gait or that stiffness. But most primary cares don't have their patients walk down the hall. It's not what they're looking for. So when a diagnosis is made, people with Parkinson's see neurologists. A neurologist is a doctor that specializes in diseases and disorders of the brain. But I want you all to know that there's a special type of neurologist, a movement disorder specialist neurologist, that really excels in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And these are neurologists that have done two more years of fellowship training just in movement disorders. So dystonia, Parkinson's, tremors, that's all they do. And it's been my experience that the movement disorder specialists really understand the intricacies of Parkinson's, the cognitive and behavioral symptoms, the way it progresses. They understand the medications and how to use them artfully to help control symptoms. So if you know someone with Parkinson's, suggest that they see a movement disorder specialist. And NeuroChallenge Foundation is happy to furnish a list to them or to you of all the movement disorder specialists in Southwest Florida. In addition to seeing a doctor, people with Parkinson's also benefit from seeing physical therapists who help with functionality. There's actually <coughs> Parkinson's specific physical therapy programs that exist in Charlotte County. Occupational therapists can help people with functionality in the home. They can do something called an in-home assessment where they'll come and look at the houses of where people with Parkinson's live and make recommendations to help them navigate their environment much better. <clears throat> Speech therapists can help people with Parkinson's amplify their voice. Another symptom of Parkinson's disease that I didn't mention is uh, vocal amplitude reduction, low speech. And also with Parkinson's, because of that facial masking, that dysfunction in the facial muscles, people with Parkinson's speak very slow and they don't move their lips very much. They don't articulate very much. They don't move their lips. So speech therapists help with making voices loud and with articulation. Because we don't want people with Parkinson's to, to come away socially. We don't want them to lose their social connections and interactions, but the truth is, if you're having trouble keeping up with the conversation, if nobody can hear your voice, if no one can understand what you're saying, people are gonna start to talk over you and you're gonna start to pull away and we don't want that to happen to our Parkinson's community because they have a lot to say and they've had wonderful lives and we want them to stay engaged, it's very important. Pharmacists can help answer medication questions and then there's many mental health counselors in our community that understand Parkinson's very well and can talk about the stages and the changes and acclimating to this new normal because Parkinson's disease can change every day and bring you a new normal. So here's how you stay empowered to fight Parkinson's disease. These are the strategies that NeuroChallenge encourages our community to employ. And we'll go through them one by one briefly. Medication, exercise, nutrition, education, social support, and a positive attitude. I'm not gonna talk about specific medications per se, except for one, carbidopa, levodopa. It's been the mainstay for many, many years. But if you have Parkinson's, your first order of business is to find a good movement disorder specialist that understands and can manage your symptoms. And the second thing is to get on a good medication regimen. Now I'm someone who's more of a fan of diet and exercise to cure diseases, but I know darn well that with Parkinson's, 
a dopamine replacement agent is crucial to maintain, maintain functionality. So a good doctor and medication is the first important thing. The second important thing is exercise. Exercise has been studied extensively in Parkinson's disease and it's been shown to be as important as medication. Why? Because Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease of the muscles. So your muscles are deteriorating. The way to keep your muscles active and strong and to fight that deterioration is to move. And we are so fortunate in Charlotte County that we have Parkinson's specific exercise classes for our community. Neuro Challenge does not run them, but we have community partners that do an amazing job. Boxing classes, cycling classes, strength classes. So, so exercising in a Parkinson's specific class is critical. I like classes because you, you work harder, you're with people, it's social, it's engaging, and they're usually run by professionals who really understand the disease. So medication and a good doctor and then exercise. Nutrition is important. We heard from the nutritionist how important it is to eat clean, healthy foods. I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm not gonna tell anybody what to eat, but we know with our Parkinson's community, they suffer from constipation. So eating foods with a lot of fiber is very helpful for regularity because constipation can definitely be an issue. Water is important, drinking a lot of fluids. And then there's one little issue with protein and medication. And that is sometimes if you eat a high protein meal with carbidopa levodopa, it may not work as effectively. So doctors typically encourage their patients to take their medication an hour before eating or two hours after, more on an empty stomach to get maximal efficacy. So, educate, so doctor, right, medication, exercise, education. I have to say our Parkinson's community comes to all of our educational programs. We do large ones, we do small ones. We have an amazingly industrious, motivated community who want to learn how to live well with this disease. Because you can, and the more you know, the better able you will be to live with this disease. We have support groups for caregivers and for people with Parkinson's. And oftentimes in those support groups, People learn more from each other about how to live well with the disease than they do from the doctors that stand up on the podiums. So if I would encourage anyone that's dealing with a disease state to attend a support group. Support groups are so, so valuable. Not only do you learn from each other, but you get support from people who absolutely understand what you're going through. Because sometimes well-meaning friends or relatives will give you advice and make recommendations, but unless you're going through it, it's really hard to understand how Parkinson's is, is debilitating both the person that has it and the caregiver. So education is another component. Social support, look, if you have Parkinson's, your life is gonna be a little bit more challenging. You're gonna have to modify the things that maybe you used to like to do. But nothing's more important than being social and being active. We heard earlier that being social is actually really important for the brain it helps prevent dementia, and sometimes Parkinson's can lead to changes in cognitive functioning. So be social, come out, do the things you used to like to do. If you're part of a golf group and you get Parkinson's and you can't play golf like you used to, figure out a way to modify it. Maybe you swing differently. Maybe you get a different golf club. Maybe you take up a pickleball or something else or some other sport that doesn't require a swing. But don't drop out of your activities 100%. Stay social and stay involved. And then of course, a positive attitude. No matter what life brings us, and we've all had our trials and tribulations, a positive attitude is gonna make it all that much easier. Be positive, stay focused in the present. Most importantly, be focused, um, not only in the present, but be willing to be adaptable. Because Parkinson's disease brings changes. If you're willing to adapt, if you're willing to accept those changes, it's gonna be a lot easier than trying to fight it or being in denial or, or being feeling sorry for yourself. And, and that's okay to do in the short term, but ultimately, to live well with Parkinson's, you have to be strong and have to fight it. Attitude is everything, so pick a good one. Um, we talked a little bit about Neuro Challenge Foundation and what we do. Again, we're a nonprofit organization. So we are here to help empower people with Parkinson's and their caregivers to provide education and support and care advising. 
We do a very large scale Parkinson's Expo that's coming up on April 13th in a few weeks. It's free of charge. I've got flyers in the back. All you have to do is call and register. We've got 10 national thought leaders and about 40 vendors uh, who, who offer Parkinson's services. So please come and join us. And we do support groups right here in Charlotte County. We do a group in Englewood two groups in Punta Gorda, and one group in Port Charlotte. So we are a local organization in the community where you live to help you live well with Parkinson's disease. We have amazing community partners like Chelsea Place, like home care companies, physical therapists that help us deliver our services. They make therapeutic and fun experiences for our community. And if you want help from NeuroChallenge, all you have to do is call us. That's our phone number. You can ask to speak with a care advisor. I'm, uh, I oversee all of our programming and I guarantee someone will call you back. You will get a live person that will listen to you with empathy and compassion. It's very, very important to provide you with that kind of service and I'll make sure that happens. And that's a picture from one of our symposiums. There's about 600 people in that room. That's up in Sarasota. We actually do a nice distinguished speaker series event here in Port Charlotte. It's coming up on April, um, not April, August, no, not August. <laughs> October, it's coming up in October, on October 12th at the Murdoch Baptist Church, and that's on the flyer in the back as well. They're in bags. Yes, thank you. So, uh, so that's all I've got. If anyone has questions, I will be in the hair salon. Um, and thank you for your time today, I truly appreciate it.